Often bigot anti-Islamist and cunning Christian missionaries falsely allege that Muslims are sanctioned to rape women, according to Islam. And as for evidence of this false allegation, bigot anti-Islamist and cunning Christian missionaries cite the Quran, chapter 4, verse 24. Uh, what the Quran says in Surah An-Nisa, chapter 4, verse 24, the Quran legalizes, sanctions, permits that Muslim men to take married women, whom they've taken captive, I should say. This is chapter 4, verse 24. Women whom they've taken captive who are still married, the Quran allows the Muslim men to rape them at will and then sell them off, even though they're still married. That's chapter 4, verse 24. According to the Quran, according to Surah 424, they can have sex with them anyway. They can have sex with them all the way to the next town, and then they get to that town, they haven't impregnated them, and so they can, they can sell them there. Exactly. This is what your sources say. This is what the Quran says. This is what all six collections of Sahih Sitta, your most reliable collections of narrations about Muhammad, this is what all of them say. You have not read the Quran. You have not read any of these collections of Ahadith. And you condemn us yeah. for telling you what it actually says. You're condemning us for accurately kind of representing Muslim? Islam. Let's take a close look at this verse to understand what Allah, the God, really stated in this verse. To understand the context of verse 24, we have to read from verse 22. In verses 22 and 23, Allah, the one true God, designated the laws for forbidden marriages. And in the continuation of the laws of verses 22 and 23, in verse 24, Allah, the God, forbade marital relation with women who are already married, except those with whom one is married or those whom one faithfully own, right hand possess. Then Allah the God commanded the Muslims to marry those who are lawful for marriage and present them with bridal dew and provide for them from one's wealth and to desire to be chaste and forbade to be lustful or lecherous. And in verse 25, Allah the God commanded, If a Muslim does not have the means to marry free women, then the Muslim shall marry pious believing women from those whom they faithfully and rightfully own or someone else's pious woman, with the permission of the faithful and rightful owner, and to present the woman with bridal do, as they, the rightful, the faithful owner, and the rightfully and faithfully owned, are one from another. And then, Allah the God forbade the taking of secret lovers. Now, where does it say in this verse of the Qur'an that rape is allowed? The nasty trick bigot anti-Islamist and cunning Christian missionaries play is they try very hard to make an Arabic expression from the Qur'an look detestable. Ma malakat aymanukum. Notice what happens here. It allows her to have a false view of Islam, one which only allows Muslims to have sex to uh, women that they marry. But the Quran itself says you can have sex with those whom your right hands possess. Yeah. These are your female captives. According to Islam, it is absolutely forbidden to enslave people, unlike Christianity. But, however, Islam does allow taking of captives in war, but only those men and women who participated in the war, and not civilians who are at their home, which is very practical in such situations. At the time of Muhammad, the Messenger of Allah, and his disciples, the Muslims did not have any prison, and the Muslims distributed and kept the war captives among their own households. Muhammad, the Messenger of Allah, the God, said, Allah has made some of your brothers as slaves under your care. So whoever has his brother under his care, then let him feed him from his food, and let him clothe him from his clothes, and do not give him a duty that he cannot bear. And if you give him a duty he cannot bear, then assist him with it. Ma malakat aymanukum does not mean slave or captive at all. But, however, as an implication, ma malakat aymanukum can also be implied for captives or slaves. The Arabic word for female slave is amatun, and the Arabic word for captive is asiron. In the verse of the Qur'an, chapter 2, verse 221, Allah, the one true God, forbade nikah. 
sexual relation, marriage, etc., with polytheist women, and stated it is better to marry a believing female slave than to nikah an unbelieving woman, even if the unbelieving woman allures one. And it is the same in the case of polytheist man and male slave. A believing male slave is better than an unbelieving man. Ma malakat aymanukum is very often translated in English as what right hand possess, but its literal translation is what own faithfully. Essentially, ma malakat aymanukum implies to something or someone that one owns rightfully and faithfully. These cunning Christian missionaries and anti-Islamists are claiming that it was Allah who sanctioned sexual relation with slaves and captives without marriage. But the fact of the matter is, people were already committing all forms of sins and wrongdoings. Allah, the one true God, reformed people by revealing revelation to his messenger Muhammad, which contained words that increased people's faith in the God made people conscious about their deeds, as they will be accountable of their actions on the day of recompense. Allah, the merciful God, authorized rules and recommended marriage with bridal due between the faithful and rightful owner and their right hand possess. Allah the God forbade the taking of paramour or lover and commanded to marry for desiring to be chaste and forbade to be lustful or lecherous. If Allah, the God, wanted the faithful and rightful owner to have sex with their right hand possess without marriage, then Allah, the God, would not have authorized laws and guidelines of marriage between faithful and rightful owners and right hand possess. The only way an immoral society can transform into a moral society is through periodic reformation. Before Muhammad, the messenger of the God, People were so morally corrupted that they even corrupted revelations revealed to previous prophet by the God to legitimize their wrongdoings. Allah the God sent his messenger Muhammad with his revelations to reform the morally corrupted society where people were committing all kinds of sexual immoralities. Step by step with time and increased restrictions reformed the most immoral society into the most pious society. According to Hadith, a woman was brought to Muhammad, the Messenger of Allah, to be his spouse. When Muhammad, the Messenger of Allah, went close to her, the woman said, I seek refuge with Allah from you. Then Muhammad, the Messenger of Allah, said to the woman, That you have sought refuge with one who is great. Go back to your family. Khalid ibn Walid, the great general and disciple of Muhammad, the Messenger of Allah, had to face charges in the court when he took a captive as his spouse after penalizing her captive husband for mass-murdering Muslims. Virar ibn al-Azwar, a ferocious warrior and a disciple of Muhammad the Messenger of Allah, got attracted to a captive woman and asked his companions to grant her to him, and his companions did so. But later on, he felt guilty and went to his general Khalid ibn Walid and informed him what he has done. Khalid intended to make this relation permissible, but Virar insisted that it should only be made permissible with the knowledge and approval of the then leader of the followers of Islam, Umar ibn Khattab. But when Umar was informed about this by a letter, Umar condemned this and wrote a letter back, commanding that Virar should be stoned to death for his action. But Virar died of plague before the reaching of Umar's message, and Khalid commented that Allah did not want to disgrace Virar. Juwairiyah bin Talharit was a war captive. Muhammad, the messenger of the God, proposed her for marriage. Juwairiyah bin Talharit accepted the marriage proposal and gave her consent, and only then Muhammad, the messenger of the God, married Juwairiyah bin Talharit. Therefore, we learn that it is absolutely against Islam and the practice of Muhammad, the Messenger of Allah, to force anyone, even captives, to be one's spouse. And Allah, the Almighty God, appointed Muhammad, peace be upon him, as the role model for every Muslim, as Muhammad, peace be upon him, 
is the best of human beings and the final messenger of Allah, the one true God. If a man and a woman take each other exclusively and abides each other's responsibilities and dues and are socially known as couple and not in secret, then it is also a form of marriage. And it is absolutely forbidden in Islam to share one's wife, whether the man is with a free woman or a captive slave woman. All forms of prostitution are forbidden in Islam. Muhammad, the Messenger of Allah, the God, said, There is no prostitution of slave girls in Islam. Whoever engaged in such prostitution during the days of ignorance and a child was born as a result, the child is to be attributed to the owner of the slave girl. When a faithful and rightful owner takes his faithfully and rightfully owned as spouse and she begets children, then she is honored with the title Ummul Walad, which means mother of child. The right hand possessed spouses were the homemakers. People knew they were a couple and they also had children together. If we compared the life of the right hand possessed owned spouses, then their life was similar to the life of present day housewives and homemakers. And every owner and right hand possessed did not have husband and wife relationship. There were cases where some people's right hand possess were married to some other people as well. Allah, the one true God, designated laws in the Quran by which a slave can approach authorities and bargain ways for freedom, and commanded the rightful and faithful owner that, if those who your right hands own seeks emancipation, contract with them accordingly and fairly, and give the right hand possess from the wealth that Allah the God has blessed you with and forbade forcing right hand possessed to do anything which is immoral, and if under compulsion a right hand possessed commit anything immoral, then there will be no blame on the right hand possessed, and the right hand possessed is innocent, but the blame will be on the compeller, and the compeller will be guilty. Allah, the one true God, stated in the Quran that righteousness is the spending of wealth, spite love for it, to set slaves free. Muhammad, the Messenger of Allah, stated in his hadith, One who treats badly slaves or those under his authority will not enter paradise. Your slaves are your brothers, so treat him well. Ask for their help in what is too much for you, and help them in what is too much for them. Do not address as my slave, as we all are the slaves of Allah, the God, but rather address as my lad or my lady. Feed them what you eat, and plot them what you wear. He who has a female slave, and educates her, and treats her nicely, and then manumits her, and then marries her, will get double reward. He who slaps his slave or beats him, the expiation for it is that he should set him free. Contemplate. If according to Islam, one has to manumit his non-spouse slave for a slap on the face, then how about raping the slave? Rape is far worse than a slap on the face. Rape is absolutely forbidden in Islam. If anyone kills his slave, we shall kill him. And if anyone cuts off the nose of his slave, we shall cut off his nose. On the Day of Judgment, Allah and His Messenger will be against those who enslave people. Therefore, the Islamic outlook of slavery is very different from the conventional oppressive outlook of slavery. From an Islamic outlook, a slave is just like, if not better, than a present-day hired employee. While going for a journey on a ride, Muhammad, the Messenger of Allah, and his disciples used to distribute time in three parts. One part of time for the animal, to be free of burden. One part for the driver of the animal. And one part for the rider. Does anyone in modern time who has car and can afford driver drives their own car to let their driver rest for being fair? No, no one does that, unless it be for their fancy. Some people seem to have problem with this concept of marriage, where a man or a woman take their right hand possess a spouse. But at the same time, these people with these kind of mind seem to have no problem with the obscenous practice of fornication in the society, where everyone is having sex with everyone, 
and there is no place for sexual morality. If the attitude of Islam towards female slaves were oppressive, then why would Allah, the God, who designated Islam as the way of life for human being, would command his messenger Muhammad to state, double reward for the one who educates his female slave, treats her nicely, and then manumits her and marries her. According to Hadith of Muhammad, the Messenger of Allah, if an individual forces himself on a female slave, then he, the perpetrator, will be penalized, but the female slave is innocent. Some Differences Between Wives and Right-Hand-Possessed Spouses Wives have certain rights that right-hand-possessed spouses do not have. While marrying a free woman, she can put condition in marriage contract, and the husband must agree to the condition before the marriage can take place. For example, the husband may not marry anyone else as long as he is married to her. But a right-hand-possessed spouse can consent or refuse. She cannot put condition. A husband has to take permission from the free woman wife before using contraception. But the husband does not have to take permission from the right-hand possessed spouse before using contraception. A free woman can very easily divorce her husband at a court. But it is complicated for a right-hand possessed spouse to divorce her owner at a court, unless her owner apostatizes from Islam. Ma malakat aymanukum is a beautiful Arabic expression, which is used for implying the purity of owning. But shameless bigot anti-Islamist and cunning Christian missionaries misconstrues its actual meaning to make Islam look detestable. And it is not possible to make Islam look detestable, except by lying about Islam. Think about this. Are these... The, men, the Muslim men who are having sex with these women, according to your most reliable collections of ahadith, are they marrying these women before they have sex nope. with them? No! They are, do, they are specifically withdrawing themselves before they finish and impregnate the women because they're about to sell them into slavery at the next town. Mm -hmm. So they're capturing these women, they're slaughtering their families, and when their husbands are alive, they can have sex, according to the Quran. That they had taken captive after they killed their families, destroyed their villages, and plundered them, and they wanted to sleep with them, but at the same time, they didn't want to get them pregnant. So they went to Muhammad and said, what should we do? He goes, when you sleep with them, then you can do al-azil. I don't want to even repeat what it is. It's so shameful and despicable. You go read it and see what al-azil is. And I'll go ahead and, since, since this wasn't clear, uh, Sam pointed out azil, that the Muslims wanted to practice azil. He said he didn't want to mention it because it's so repulsive. Men would have sex with women, and they would withdraw before they finished their sexual act so that they would not get the women pregnant because they were taking these women to the next town so that they could sell them to other men. These anti-Islamist and cunning Christian missionaries are claiming that according to Quran and all books of Hadith, the practice of Muhammad, the messenger of the God, and his disciples and Muslims were to continually rape captives without getting them pregnant by practicing the withdrawal method of contraception so that they can sell the captives on the next town. These are absolutely false. What these bigot anti-Islamist and cunning Christian missionaries are claiming are their own sick imagination and no more than slander. Where does it say in the Quran or in the Hadith that Muslims are allowed to rape captives without getting them pregnant? so that the Muslims can sell the captives in the market of the next town? Or is there any such example from the life of the messenger of the God Muhammad or his disciples? No. There is no such verse in the Quran or any such hadith in the books of hadith. Muhammad, the messenger of the God, never did such a thing. The disciples of Muhammad, the messenger of the God, never did such a thing. The guideline of Quran and the hadith is exactly opposite of what bigot anti-Islamist and cunning Christian missionaries slanders. These cunning Christian missionaries and anti-Islamists are claiming that the Muslims wanted to rape the captives, but did not want the captives to get pregnant. So they went for advice from Muhammad, the messenger of the God. And Muhammad, the messenger of the God, advised the Muslims to practice azal, to avoid pregnancy. 
If we read the books of Hadith, we will realize how good our cunning Christian missionaries and bigot anti-Islamists at lying and twisting contents in order to deceive people against Islam. According to the books of Hadith, Muslims wanted to castrate themselves in order to free themselves from sexual urges as they went for long expedition, away from their wives. But Muhammad, the messenger of the God, commanded them to hold patience and forbade castration. And when the opportunity came for some Muslims to marry, Muhammad, the messenger of the God, allowed the Muslims to marry on the expedition, either temporarily, meaning marry and observe if both are compatible, if both are compatible, then remain married, but if both are not compatible, then part away. Therefore, both the groom and bride were aware that there was a chance of divorce, as the marriage was taking place while in an expedition between two people from different place and society. Or, permanently, no objective of future divorce and taking of the wife back home. And it was the Muslims who did not want to have children from temporary marriage. Therefore, the Muslims wanted to practice azal to avoid pregnancy. Therefore, they went to Muhammad, the messenger of the God, to seek advice if doing so would be ethical. And Muhammad, the messenger of the God, was surprised by these and in exclamation he asked, Do you really do that? Later on, Muhammad, the messenger of the God, forbade temporary marriage as some evil people may take advantage of this method of marriage and turn it into prostitution. And Muslims wanting to castrate themselves on expedition and Muhammad, the messenger of the God, allowing Muslims temporary marriage proves that rape was never part of Islam. These cunning Christian missionaries and anti-Islamists are pretending to be disgusted by this Arabic word azal, which is an Arabic word for a primitive method of contraception. Azal is precisely the withdrawal method of contraception. There is nothing detestable about this method of contraception, which is primitive, natural, but not very effective. These cunning Christian missionaries and anti-Islamists are pretending to be disgusted only to make Islam look obscene. How do these cunning Christian missionaries and anti-Islamists read their own religious book, Bible, which contains hardcore obscenities? He rode upon a cherub. He rode Allah Baritala. He is riding on a cherub. And flew, God Almighty is flying on a cherub. You know what's a cherub? Do you know what is a chirub? No, no. You see, I went to St. Peter's in Rome. St. Peter's brother has also been there, I'm sure. He has been speaking about St. Peter's in his book, so he must have gone to St. Peter's in Rome. It's a huge, huge church. St. Peter's in Rome at the Vatican. Inside the Vatican, inside. You see, I don't know. The youngsters that were with me, you see, they made me to stand against a wall and they took some shots. And the shot was of this Chirubim. Chirubim is a plural of Chirub. Chirubim meaning young crisp angels. See, angels are beautiful women with wings. In Western artistry, designs, drawings, you find beautiful women, well proportioned. This is 36, 24, 36. <laughs> with wings are, you know, mature angels. A cherub is a young thing. You find this in the Collins Dictionary, they give you a definition. A child-like angel. Childish angel. Cherubim. So the picture is here. I know for all of you, you to see, I think once it is on video, you'll be able to see that close quarters in marble. This was in flesh-colored marble. You can pass this on. You know, can you have, oh, you have seen it? You see, this is absolutely naked girls, absolutely in marble, flesh color marble. In the Holy of Holies, they have wings. That's the only thing. Otherwise, naked, you can see the breast, the nipples, and the buttocks. And if you fondle the buttocks, millions of hands have gone over the buttocks from the sheen on that marble. You can make out that everybody passes by wants to feel that marble. And there's a sheen, you know, this type of shine on the marble will give you an electric shock. 
if you touch it. God Almighty, imagine, is riding these things, these young girls, young girls, young Christians, he didn't know about a helicopter, this God of ours, you know, he didn't know about a flying saucer, no. he's riding little girls. What are you doing? What a mockery you are making of God! This is what hurts the Muslim. You are making a mockery of God. You say, and God told you this? He's telling you, right, little girls? Naked girls? Shame. It's a shame. And incest? There are ten cases of incest in this book of God. Ten. The types and types of incest that you can commit a textbook, if you want to know what were types, and as a result, in my country, the whites of South Africa, most of them are Christians. Eight percent of all whites in South Africa, they commit incest with their own daughters, and 13 percent of the Americans are committing incest with their own daughters. After the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, he goes and lives in a cave says the Bible, in a place called Zor, him and his two daughters. And the eldest daughter tells the younger that our father is old, you know, he's gone cold, and there's not another man on earth who can come in unto us in the manner of men. You know how what men do? That, there's nobody else to do that to us. So come, let us make our father drink wine. I'm only reading the Bible, the Holy Bible, word for word. If anybody has it, open it and see, word for word. Say, our father is old, and there is not another man on earth who can come into us in the manner of men. Say, so come, let us make our father drink wine, and we will lie with him so that we may preserve the seed of our father. They want to preserve the father's seed. And the eldest daughter makes the father drink wine, and she goes and lies with him, and he knew not when she lay down, nor when she arose. He didn't know. He was too dead drunk, says the Bible. Then, next night, the elder daughter tells this, her sister, he said, look, yesterday night, means last night, I slept with my father. Tonight you do the same. So they repeated the performance. And thus, just like that, Dalika, just like that, both the daughters of Lot were with child by their father. Incest, children of incest. And the firstborn gave birth to a son, and they named him Moab. And the other one gave birth to a son, and they called his name Ammon, from which we get the Ammonites and the Moabites. In the Bible, Ammonites and the Moabites. Rape and mass murder. When the children of Israel, when they were in the Sinai, and when they were told to go and conquer Palestine, they were told, go and kill the Palestinians, men, women, and children. Even sucklings are not to be spared. Little babies sucking the mother's breast not to be spared. Kill them all. But the children, the Ammonites and the Moabites, thou shalt not touch because they are the children of Lord. Blessed. Father having relationship with his daughters, those children are blessed. But you Palestinians, you Arabs, rubbish, kill them all. This merciful God is telling the Jews, kill them all. Men, women and children. Only, and not even sucklings. Here's what Numbers 31, 17, 18 says. Now, therefore, God is telling Moses, kill every male among the little ones and kill every woman. Now, notice this, who has known man by lying with him. Kill all the women who are not virgins. But all the young girls who have not known man by lying with him, keep alive for yourselves. You see, God is saying, keep all the virgins so that you can ravage them. That's what they say. To see again, this is an act of mercy and compassion on the part of God. So then why does he spare the virgins? Because the virgins did not entice the men to sin by committing sexual immorality and worshipping Baal. Every non-virgin used sex to entice people for committing sins? Absolutely bogus. If virgins were to be spared because they did not entice people with sex for committing sins, then what was the fault of little children and infants? This clever Christian missionary and bigot anti-Islamist very cunningly skipped out on the guideline given by the triune God, Father, Jesus, and Ghost in the Bible, for the unjust mass murder of little children and infants. Was this guideline of the Bible a specific prophecy about a specific individual, like the one in the Quran, about an individual 
a lad who would oppress his pious believing parents by obstinate rebellion and disbelief? No. The triune God of the Bible, Father, Jesus, and Ghost, revealed a general guideline. Kill men, non-virgins, little children, and infants, but keep alive virgins for yourselves, which is to be applied every time while dealing with enemies by the followers of Bible. In the book of Numbers, chapter 31, verse 31, he is more merciful to the Palestinians. Now he says, kill them all, men, women, and children, even donkeys are not to be spared. Kill the donkeys even. I said, what sin did the donkeys commit? <laughs> that this God of mercy wants to kill even donkeys. What have they done? <laughs> but kill even the donkeys. But virgins you must save for yourself. Women which no man has known and had no sexual experience. That woman you must save for yourself. And they saved for themselves, says the holy book, in inverted commas, 32,000 Palestinian virgins for themselves. And 30 and 2 was for the Lord. Lord means God. 32 was his share, God's share, out of those virgins, Palestinian virgins. I'm asking, what does the Lord do with virgins? What does he do? You tell me, what does the Lord do with virgins? Except in the name of the Lord, the priest will enjoy them. And how do you know that the woman is a virgin? A soldier in the field, he comes across a young woman. How does he verify? I leave it to your imagination. And God Almighty, some special liking, I said, I don't know what type of thing, loves them so much, the Palestinians. And Moses, I'm re reading from the book of Numbers, chapter 31, verses 15, 17, and 18. And Moses said to them, have you kept all the women alive? All the women, you have kept them alive? Now therefore, kill every male among the little ones. Every male child among the little ones of the Palestinians, kill them. And every, kill every woman who has known man intimately. If any woman has ever had sex with a man, kill them also. But keep alive for yourselves all the young girls, not the little ones. Little ones is a liability. You've got to feed them and bring them up. No time for that. But keep alive for yourselves the, all the young girls, the Palestinian young girls, who have not known a man intimately. This is the instruction given to Jewish soldiers in the field. Now when they see a young Palestinian girl, how can you verify whether this woman has experienced sex or not? How do you verify? The soldier in the field, he doesn't know about the saliva test. He doesn't know anything about it. The only way is to rape and ravish these Palestinian girls to verify whether a man has been through her or not. And if they discover that she has already been used second hand, chop off her head. If not, keep them. And they saved for themselves 32,000 Palestinian girls whom no man had known. After raping and ravishing them, they saved for themselves 32,000 for themselves. And out of that, the Lord Almighty, God Almighty, must also have his pound of flesh. So it says, and 30 and 2 was for the Lord. I am asking, what does the Lord with do with, what does he do with 32 raped and ravished Palestinian girls? You tell me. In the book of God, God giving instructions that you go along and you verify. God talking this filth and dirt, kill every little child, male and female, kill them all. Only young girls you must keep. And they too, one that know they have not known man sexually. Moreover, another objection goes like this. How did they know they were virgins? After all, who told them? Didn't they have to sleep with them? No. Again, read the context. Who is speaking to Moses? God. Here the context presupposes a supernatural encounter with God where God is speaking directly to Moses. Are you telling me God can't tell the virgins from the non-virgins and can't reveal it to the Israelites? They don't need to sleep with them sexually to know they're virgins. God could reveal that knowledge supernaturally to Moses and say, here they are, set them apart. False. The triune God of the Bible, Father, Jesus, and Ghost, never reveals any revelation distinguishing virgins from non-virgins for the followers of Bible.
or revealed any revelations making distinctions between babies and infants who will grow up to be a good human being or a bad human being. Deuteronomy 21, 10 to 14. Christians hear this. Muslims hear this. The difference between Moses and your prophet. When you go forth to war against your enemies, Deuteronomy 21, 10 to 14, and the Lord your God has delivered them into your hands, and you have taken them captive, and you see among the captives a beautiful woman, and have a desire for her to have her as your wife. Okay? Then you are to bring her home to your house. She is to shave her head and, and trim her nails, signs of mourning. <clears throat> she must also discard the clothing of her captivity, because in order to remove the stigma that she has been taken captive, get rid of those clothes to help her in that transition. And she'll remain in your house and mourn her father and her mother for a full month. After that, you may have relations with her. You can't touch her for a month. Let her mourn and be her husband, and she will be your wife. Now notice how beautiful this is. It will be, if you are not pleased with her, then you must let her go wherever she pleases, but you may not sell her at all for money, nor are you to make merchandise of her because you have humbled her. Really? It's a beautiful verse? Does these shameless trolls and liars think everyone is gullible? How gullible must be the people who believe these kind of devils in the form of human being? Shaving head for a girl or a woman cannot be a sign for moaning. It's humiliating. It's heartbreaking. It's a punishment, making the virgin feel helpless, weak, and disgraced. It is torture. Does these cunning Christian missionaries and bigot anti-Islamists expect people to believe that by following the guidelines of Jesus, the God and inspirer of the Bible, the followers of Bible are doing justice to the virgin? And the virgin is feeling glad that after the killing of her father, her mother, and her infant brother, the followers of the Bible are stripping her naked and shaving her hair so that she can mourn. So helpful. And is not selling her a favor to her? Or the real reason is, no one is going to buy her as she is psychologically broken, raped, and physically mutilated. She has no worth left and she has no place to go. Her everything is ruined. The only reason and her only fault she has to go through all these physical and mental tortures, humiliations, is because she was a virgin. If she was not a virgin, or a man, or baby, or an infant, she would have had the sweet relief of death. As the triune God declared in the Bible that happy, blessed, shall be the one who dash babies on the rock. Incestuous rape rape not only rape how to rape your own sister if you want to it's given to you in detail if you want to rape your own sister one of the sons of david he set you an example what what you must do if you want to rape your own sister gang rape is there a son goes and prohibits 10 of his father's wives 10 in a row i'm telling you, this is in the holy book a christian lady here in the uk here in the uk she wrote a letter she says ban the book Ban the Bible. What it has, ban it. But of course, your salvation. Explicit sexual acts. Obscene, explicit defining of body parts. When he comes up here next time to read for us from Ezekiel chapter 23, starting with verse number 1, going all the way to verse number 21. And if not that much, then start from verse 11. And if he doesn't have time for that much, start from, just, just read verses 20 and 21. Amen. We'll be okay. And uh, in fact, why don't you read this from this children's Bible? Sure. So that uh, folks can be sure what is there in the children's Bible. Young Explorer's Bible, New International Version, I'll leave that with you. It'll be here when you come back. Just read for us from that. Ezekiel 23, verse 20 to 21. There she lusted after her lavers, whose genitals were like those of donkeys, and whose emissions was like that of horses. So you longed for the lewdness of your youth when in Egypt your bosom was caressed and your young breast fondled. Now Shabir wants to throw this out for a shock effect. Basically he thinks that Christians who read this passage will be shooken up. This is what you have in the Bible? 
I said to you people, pornography is no pornography. 24 hours a day, you see it on TV. So it doesn't shock you anymore. Suppose you understood it too, it won't shock you. You see the, the words, you know, the language that they're using, filthy, dirty language, every other word is a swear word. So to you, pornography is no pornography. This was the thing. But I challenged, I said, no decent man, no decent Christian can read it to his mother, his sister, his daughter, or even to his fiancée if she's a good woman. That's why God read it. And now we found out that he was not a good man. You found out that he was not a decent man. He proved again and again that he's not a decent man. He read it. But I, I, I doubt if a sensible Christian can ever come and read it to his congregation. Ezekiel chapter 16. Ezekiel chapter 23. Etc. In fact, the triune God of these cunning Christian missionaries and anti-Islamists never condemned or criticized slavery, or taking captives, or taking concubines, in their religious book, the Bible. On the contrary, if we study Bible, we will learn that the prophets in the Bible had taken slaves as concubines, or in the language used by these cunning Christian missionaries and anti-Islamists for Islam, as sex slaves. The triune God of the Bible authorized explicit guideline for massacring people, taking female virgins as sex slave, torturing female captives so that they subdue. Happy, blessed, shall be the one who dash babies on the rock. Selling of own family members as slaves. Selling abducted or captives as slaves. Disciplining slaves with beating and not pampering slaves with humane treatment or else the slaves will become stubborn. Marriage of rape victims to her rapist and forbiddance of divorce. And the list goes on and on. Jesus, the incarnation of the second person of the Trinity, the Son, and the most favorite God of these cunning Christian missionaries and anti-Islamists, whom the cunning Christian missionaries and anti-Islamists claim is the most loving never condemned or never spoke against any of these oppressions according to the Bible. According to the Bible, Jesus had the time to abolish divorce and declare marriage with divorced women as adultery, but never had the time to condemn oppressive regulations authorized by him. On the contrary, Jesus said, Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law, till all be fulfilled. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments, and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Matthew chapter 5 Verse 17 to 19. Now, what are the general guidelines in Islam for Muslims? The general guidelines in Islam for Muslims are to be prepared against the enemies with whatever power and steeds of war that the Muslims are able to acquire, by which Muslims may cause fear and deter the enemies of Allah and the enemies of Muslims, and the hidden secret enemies about whom Muslims are not aware but Allah knows them. But, if the enemies incline to peace, then the Muslims must also incline to peace, and have faith in Allah. Indeed, Allah is the all-hearing, the all-knowing. But if the enemies intend to deceive Muslims, then sufficient for Muslims is Allah. It is Allah who supports Muslims with His help and with the believers. During a battle, Muslims have the following options. 1. Kill. 2. Capture. 3. Besiege. 4. If the enemies repent and accept Islam, then set them free. If a non-Muslim or some non-Muslims desires peace with Muslims, then those non-Muslims are to be escorted to safety by the Muslims. 
Muslims are not allowed to destroy an inhabited place. The civilians are safe and secure as long as they do not rebel. Muslims are not allowed to force anyone to leave their religion and accept Islam. Civilians, those who confine themselves to their house, are safe and secure. The properties and wealth of civilians are safe and secure. People who have dedicated their lives living in monasteries are safe and secure. Muslims are commanded to treat war captives with mercy and respect. Muslims are forbidden to separate family members, for example, husband and wife, or mother and son, or father and daughter, etc., among captives. Muslims are not allowed to be treacherous. Muslims are not allowed to deceive. If a Muslim promises safety to anyone and then breaks his promise and kills the enemy, then death penalty will be for that Muslim. The Muslims are not allowed to commit zina, fornication, adultery, rape, etc. Death penalty for those who has sexual intercourse by force with the captive. Muslims are not allowed to kill women. Muslims are not allowed to kill children. Muslims are not allowed to kill those who are old, blind, insane, crippled, or handicapped. Muslims are not allowed to cut down fruit-bearing trees or crops. Muslims are not allowed to slaughter animals except for food. Muslims are not allowed to burn bees and scatter them. According to the opinion of the scholars, the bees here also imply to any kind of chemical or biological weapons that causes disease. Muslims are not allowed to steal from the booty. Muslims are not allowed to act cowardly. Muslims are not allowed to mutilate dead body. Bigot anti-Islamist and cunning Christian missionaries twist beautiful verses of Quran and beautiful hadith of Muhammad, the Messenger of Allah, to make Islam look detestable, and very cautiously hides these hadith and verses of Quran and acts as if these don't even exist. Bigot anti-Islamists and cunning Christian missionaries very deceptively and skillfully quotes some parts of an event from Islamic sources, and then twistedly misrepresents the event, different from how it actually happened, to give example as evidence for their false allegations. Now we captured the men and the women. So these aren't just our female captives, these are married female captives. They have hus Isn't this adultery? So Muhammad's companions were reluctant to have sex with them. Wait, we're not sure what to do here. And they go to Muhammad for advice. Muhammad, what should we do? So Allah the Exalted sent down the Quranic verse, and all married women are forbidden unto you, save those captives whom your right hands possess. What verse is that, Sam? That's chapter 4, verse 24, what I just read. So... Context does matter, my Muslim friends, but context doesn't help you. When you actually go to the context, you find out these verses are every bit as despicable as they sound. And that is a horrible, horrible teaching. You can capture a woman and her husband and then rape the woman in the presence of her husband. And who cares? Exactly. They're filthy unbelievers. Uh, but Allah says it's all okay. Allah puts his stamp of approval on it. Absolutely false. Muhammad, the messenger of the God, never did such a thing. The disciples of Muhammad, the messenger of the God, never did such a thing. The guideline of Quran and the Hadith is exactly opposite of what bigot anti-Islamist and cunning Christian missionary slanders. The Muslims are not allowed to commit zina, fornication, adultery, rape, etc. Death penalty for those who has sexual intercourse by force with the captive. According to Hadith of Muhammad, the Messenger of Allah, if an individual forces himself on a female slave, then he, the perpetrator, will be penalized, but the female slave is innocent. Muhammad, the Messenger of Allah, the God, forbade Muslims to separate family members, for example, husband and wife, or mother and son, or father and daughter, etc., among captives. And Allah, the one true God, forbade nikah, sexual relation, 
marriage, etc., with polytheists. Before taking a close look at the Hadith, let's look at another Hadith, which explains the history of the captives of Taif on which this Hadith is based. And bigot anti Islamists and cunning Christian missionaries will never mention this Hadith, as it will expose their deceits. According to this Hadith, the people of Taif wholeheartedly embraced Islam and came to Muhammad the Messenger of Allah and appealed to return their captives. And Muhammad, the Messenger of Allah, commanded the Muslims, These brethren of yours have come to you with repentance, and I see it proper to return their captives to them. And the Muslims gladly and willingly returned the captives. Now, let's take a close look at the Hadith. According to this Hadith, captives were taken by Muslims in a battle, when Muslims were ambushed by the soldiers of Taif in the valley of Hunayn and some of them were female. According to another hadith, the soldiers of Taif brought their women with them in the battlefield for assistance and for the courage of men, so that the soldiers don't act cowardly. But when the battle got intense, these men ran away leaving their women behind. Allah, the one true God, stated in verses 5 to 8 of chapter 76 of the Quran that the righteous those who will have salvation and paradise in the afterlife will keep their vow, be conscious of the day of judgment, and spend their food and wealth, spite of love for it, for the needy, orphan, and captive. At a time when war captives were most ill-treated, the humanitarian guideline of Islam from the verses of Quran and the Hadith of Muhammad, the Messenger of Allah, became revolutionary and worked instrumentally for the conversion of pagan captives to Islam. Further, if we read from the Hadith, we learn Muslim men were reluctant to have relationship with these female captives because of their pagan husbands, meaning the women were no longer pagans and have embraced Islam, but their husbands were pagans and alive. And according to Islam, if a pagan accepts Islam, but their spouse does not accept Islam, then their marriage is automatically divorced. And in the end of the Hadith, we read, those captive women will be lawful after completing their waiting period. What is this waiting period for? If Muslim men were evil rapists who wanted to oppress women, then why wait for anything? According to Islam, a female captive must wait one month, a divorced Muslim woman must wait three months, and a widow Muslim woman must wait four months and ten days before she can marry again. Therefore, we understand from this hadith that Muslim men were not evil rapists who wanted to oppress and rape women. And Allah, the merciful, the kind, the one true God, made laws to save captive women from any ill fate, and ways to live safely in a household, and ways of marriage for the captive woman who embraced Islam, but whose husbands were still pagans. And as we have seen in the previous hadith, even the people of Taif, the family of captives, wholeheartedly embraced Islam. Allah, the one true God, commanded in the Quran, Marry the single among you and the righteous among your male slaves and female slaves. If they are poor, Allah will enrich them from his bounty and Allah is all-encompassing and knowing. Chapter 24, verse 32 Bigot anti-Islamists and cunning Christian missionaries pretends as if they are quoting Islamic scriptures and textual sources. But in reality, all they do is twist the context and misconstrue the actual meaning of the content to deceive gullible audience against Islam, Muhammad, peace be upon him, and Muslims. Confirming the non-Islamic faith, fear, and despise of non-Muslims, which is also created by them against Islam, Muhammad, peace be upon him, and Muslims. The two main reasons for which bigot anti-Islamist and cunning Christian missionaries carries out these evil, unjust confederacies are for money and for controlling the societies according to their evil, oppressive system. Influential bigot anti-Islamists, like political leaders, businessmen, etc., funds medias, TV channels, NGOs, etc., to defame Islam so that power remains in their hand, 
and they can enrich themselves by oppressing Muslims. And at the same time, they do not appear as the villains in the society. A very clever way to justify the oppressions done to the Muslims. How fair, just, ethical, and moral it is to subjugate and oppress indigenous people on their own land for their ancestors' acceptance of Islam. How fair, just, ethical, and moral it is to imprison indigenous people in concentration camps on their own land for their ancestors' acceptance of Islam. How fair, just, ethical, and moral it is to torture indigenous people out from their own land for their ancestors' acceptance of Islam. By creating fear and despise against Islam and Muslims, these bigot anti-Islamist and cunning Christian missionaries are recruiting supporters who funds them and works as their soldiers against Islam and Muslims. And no one should want to or dare to support Muslims, even the Muslims themselves, and people should stay away from accepting Islam, and Muslims should stay away from practicing Islam. Allah, the Almighty, the All-Powerful God, stated in the Qur'an, They, anti-Islamists, want to extinguish the light of Allah, the God, with their mouths, but Allah, the God, will not allow that, except to perfect His light, although the rejecters of truth hates it. Verily, those who invent lie against Allah, the God, will never be successful. Like, share, and subscribe to create awareness. We are also available on Facebook, Google+, Twitter, and PalTalk.